Good morning, church. What a blessing it is to be able to continue meeting like this. Over the past two weeks or so, I've been reaching out to all of the churches within our denomination, the International Baptist Convention, to ask how we, IBC Bonn and IBC Cologne, can be praying for them. And the overwhelming response is identical, I believe, to how we as a church have felt. Sad about the separation, thankful for today's technologies that keep us connected, and also a concern for one another. Now, these are indeed strange times to be alive. They're strange times to be part of a church plant. These are strange times to be a new pastor and a new pastor of a new church. But we praise God for how the church has managed to stay connected in these last days. And we continue to pray that in this time, we would, uh, would use this time to grow in our knowledge and understanding of the Lord and our care and love for one another. After several weeks of taking a break from preaching, I'm now really excited to lead us in a time of God's Word. But let's begin with a word of prayer. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, Grant us the faith to know you and love you. May we be found beside you on the way to the cross, which is the path of glory. May we have eyes to see your beauty. And may we have hearts of worship that join in with all your creation in praising your name before men without reservation. Maybe you don't know, but today is a day that in English is called Palm Sunday. It's called Palm Sunday because the palm tree branches that were waved and, and laid on the ground for Jesus riding a donkey to walk on. I've never experienced a Palm Sunday service here in Germany or back in England where we lived for four years, but in the US, Palm Sunday is usually a really big deal in churches. Several months ago, I had all these big ideas of uh, for how to do this service. In the States, Palm Sunday often feels like a party. It's one of those Sundays that nearly everyone will attend a church service, even if they don't normally go to church. And even in very uh, formal, traditional churches, Palm Sunday is one of the liveliest services of the year. Many churches will, will do reenactments of Jesus' triumphal entry, Palm fronds will be passed out to all the children in the church, and they'll line the aisle, waving their palm leaves, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's a big party. It's, it's loud. It's fun. But there's a dark side to Palm Sunday, isn't there? Maybe you thought of it instinctively. The, the fact is that today, on Palm Sunday, Jesus will march into Jerusalem heralded as king, as God's Messiah. But by Wednesday, a plot will be hatched against him to kill him. On Thursday, he will be betrayed by one of his apostles. And, and by sunrise on Friday, he will be dragging his own cross through the city to a hill where he will die. The tension is very real. This, this tension should make us uncomfortable. This tension is important, and in, in many churches around the world, this tension is embraced. I said that many churches will hand out palm leaves, but in many other churches, people coming to church are, are handed crosses made out of palm leaves, and they wear them on their shirts. And at the end of the service on their way out, they, they give these crosses back to the church, and the church will, will burn these crosses the following year and use that, that ash for the Ash Wednesday service. This is a, Ash Wednesday, if you don't know, is the beginning of the Lenten period, the 46 days from Ash Wednesday to Easter, and 40 days of fasting. It's a period of preparation for Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that begins with a stark reminder that we are but ashes. God made us from ashes, and we will return to ashes. Salvation comes in humbling ourselves and looking to Christ. 
But by making this ash out of the crosses, the cross-shaped palm leaves, the reminder is strong that Christ was born to die. That his entire life finds its climax in the cross. The point is that Palm Sunday, today, Palm Sunday, is connected to Good Friday and to Easter. If we want to understand Good Friday, and if we want to understand Easter Sunday on a deeper level, we need to understand Palm Sunday. This whole week, this whole week that we call the Passion Week, this whole week this is a journey to the cross and to an empty tomb. What we call Passion Week begins today on the Mount of Olives, which, on which a donkey carries a king in a parade of victory. Starting Tuesday this week, we, the elders of IBC Bonn and IBC Cologne, will be uh, putting together a series of videos uh, leading us, preparing us as churches, preparing our hearts uh, for Good Friday, for Easter Sunday. But to help us understand these events, we have to understand the event of the Passion Week as a whole. And Passion Week begins with Palm Sunday. Now let's turn and read our passage. We're turning to Luke in chapter 19, in verses 28 to 40. And it reads this way. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. After reading this, maybe you're thinking, why is it called Palm Sunday? There isn't a single mention of palm leaves in that. Well, you'd be correct. And, and this very point reminds us of how important it is sometimes to allow all four Gospels to speak together in unison to paint a fuller picture of what is going on. At times, it's most prudent to allow a single gospel to give its own testimony. For us to listen carefully to what Matthew, for example, has to say. This has generally been my approach when preaching through the gospel of Matthew and IBC Bonn. But when it comes to central events in the life of Christ, like his, his birth and especially the Passion Week, the four Gospels can be used very effectively together to create a full picture. So let's rewind a few months in the life of Christ and get a running start, so to speak. You see, several months before Jesus comes into Jerusalem for Passover, he, he goes to visit his good friends Mary and Martha in a town called Bethany just right outside uh, Jerusalem. It's on the other side of the Mount of Olives uh, from Jerusalem. And he goes to visit them because their brother Lazarus has just died. Uh, so Jesus arrives. It's been four days since Lazarus died, and he arrives, and the mourners are still there. 
You remember what happened, don't you? Jesus walked to the tomb and cried out, Lazarus, come out. Of course, Lazarus rises from the dead. John describes the aftermath of this miracle this way in John chapter 11, verses 45 to 54. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, nor that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. So what were the responses to this miracle? Well, John says that some believed. Some planned to put him to death. But Jesus started uh, to travel in secret and headed into the wilderness. Jesus is making calculated decisions here. He is making calculated decisions to ensure that he will be crucified by Passover. Jesus is orchestrating everything. And now he's, he's keeping a low profile. But what about the, the Passover celebrations in Jerusalem? Is Jesus going to go? If, if he's orchestrating all of this, surely he knows the dangers that would be posed by going back to Jerusalem. Is he going to go to the Passover? Well, let's pick back up in John chapter 12 and verse 1. Now, keep in mind, this is the Friday before the triumphal entry, the Friday before Palm Sunday. And it says in John chapter 12, starting in verse 1, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever he put in it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in their Gospels, together, Add to John's account and help us to understand a fuller picture of this event. Although John makes clear that this anointing happened on Friday, Matthew, Mark, and Luke help us understand that it was this event on Friday that led Judas to betray Jesus the following Wednesday, the Wednesday after uh, the triumphal entry. They inform us that it was This anointing by Mary was the occasion for Satan entering into Judas to betray the Lord. But remember that Judas's desire to betray Jesus was 
only able to be carried out because of the anger that the Pharisees already had in their hearts against Jesus after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. This this evil plan in, in Judas's heart was only possible because on Monday and Tuesday of after the triumphal entry, Jesus would cleanse the temple and possess it. Jesus is orchestrating this all. So Jesus, he returns from his solitude in the wilderness to Jerusalem one week before the Passover. He stays with his close friends in in Bethany, his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus at their home in Bethany. And he he will return to their house day after day until Passover feast when he will enter into Jerusalem for the for the final time before his crucifixion. Bethany becomes his, his home base for the next week. After his triumphal entry, he'll, he'll briefly visit the temple, Mark 11, 11 tells us. He'll briefly enter the temple and immediately return to Bethany for the night. Then early on Monday morning, he'll, he'll quietly return to Jerusalem with his disciples. He'll he'll go in and cleanse the temple of all the money changers and merchants, and he'll teach. And then he'll return to Bethany that night to sleep. Then on Tuesday, he will once again return to the temple with his disciples, and he'll he'll possess the the temple mount again for another full day, and he'll he'll teach. He'll answer objections by the, the scribes and the Pharisees, And he'll pronounce his woes upon the religious leaders. On Wednesday, Jesus will stay in in Bethany and prepare for the Passover. Meanwhile, on that same day, Judas is is meeting with the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus. Then on Thursday, Jesus and his disciples will enter into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, and they'll, they'll go to that upper room to have a meal together. And in the late hours of Thursday night, Jesus and his disciples will go back to the Mount of Olives, to a small private garden, a grove of olive trees, where Jesus will be arrested. He'll be taken into Jerusalem, and he'll be tried and sentenced and crucified before the heat of the day on Friday. So what are we learning? What does this show us all? We're learning how connected all these events are. We're learning how important it is to have a a fuller picture of his Passion Week and how Jesus has been orchestrating all of these events, conducting things according to his Father's will. And that's important. It's important to understand this. We must understand that the part of the reason Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead was because of the, the division that it would create between those who followed him and those who were uh, seeking to kill him. You know, earlier I, I read to you about the reaction of those religious leaders after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But listen to what John has to say about those who believed in him. John describes the crowds on the Mount of Olives as as Jesus is coming in on the donkey. The the surrounding Jesus as he enters. And in John 12, 17 and 18, John says, The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. John's point is that the news about Jesus was spreading far and wide. Millions of Jews had come to Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire. They're hearing stories about Jesus. They're hearing about him raising Lazarus from the dead they want to see him. They're, they're wondering if he will come. They're hoping he comes. They're hoping that they'll catch a glimpse of him in the massive crowds of people. Imagine, have you heard about Jesus? 
Have you heard how he raised a man from the dead after he'd been dead for four days? Yeah. A apparently, that wasn't the first time he'd raised someone from the dead either. But I also heard he healed a man who was born blind. Yeah, I heard about that too. From what I heard, that really got the Pharisees all worked up. They've been giving orders that anyone who knows where he is has to report it. Man, I wonder if he'll show up for the feast. News was spreading about Jesus. And that much is clear. And the religious leaders were simultaneously enraged at Jesus and afraid of the crowds because of how much the crowds loved him. So emotions and tensions are, are high when Jesus comes over the crest of the mountain of olives and begins his descent into the city of Jerusalem. Picture this. Here he, here he comes. He's coming down the hill on a donkey surrounded by massive crowds. It's like a racer on a mountain stage in the Tour de France, totally packed in on the narrow, winding street. You see people start taking off their outer garments and laying them on the ground for the, this king to walk on. You think, if only half of the stories I've heard about this guy are true, then this must be the Messiah. So you take off your coat and lay it down with everyone else. Then you start to hear someone next to you start to quote from the prophets. And you realize this must be the Messiah. You hear him quote from Zechariah 9, 9 to 13. and says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double for I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. And you hear this, this prophecy and you think, my God, it's him. He's here. This, this is the Messiah. Then perhaps this bystander's quotation of the prophet Zechariah reminds his friend of another one of Zechariah's prophets about this Messiah, about the Messiah. And he quotes from Zechariah 14, 3 and 4 and says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by the very, a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And then your heart starts thumping as you hear yourself start to join in the chanting. Blessed is the king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. You know where those words come from, from Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And you, you notice that the chant has changed the psalm's words from blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And you believe. You believe that, that this is the Messiah. 
your heart cries out. Your heart, you hear yourself joining in with all the throngs of people, shouting praises to the Lord's anointed one. He's here to rescue Israel. But not everyone responds in this way, do they? No. Luke tells us in verse 39 of chapter 19 that that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus' Jesus' response is amazing. He he says, I tell you, if, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So listen. Listen carefully. Creation was made to give glory to God. As the pinnacle of God's creation, we were created to lead this worship. We were created to be the chorus of worship. But if we remain silent, the the rest of creation will literally cry out in worship. Let me ask you for a moment to consider how quickly the week of Christ's passion goes by. He's anointed in Bethany on Friday. And by the following Friday, he's hanging on a cross. After his triumphal entry on Sunday, the week would have flown by. Christ's followers would have been high on the emotion and excitement of the week. Jesus is meeting all of their expectations of who the Messiah is supposed to be. By the dawn of Friday morning, Christ's disciples have abandoned him. They have literally fled and hid. Judas has betrayed him. Peter has denied him. The cries of Christ's followers shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, are replaced by cries of Christ's enemies shouting, Crucify him! Instead of Christ coming into Jerusalem as a triumphant king, on the back of a donkey, among crowds of people shouting his praise, King Jesus departs Jerusalem with his cross on his back among crowds of people shouting curses. Those who praise him on Sunday are now silent. Some stand at the cross, but of of those, only one from among his apostles. And what happens? What happens with... In response to this silence, the rocks cry out. At the point of Christ's death, when humanity is silent, the rest of creation cries out and and gives testimony to the identity and glory of Christ. The earth quakes. The rocks split. Even the sky responds by going black. At this testimony of creation, the centurion standing by the cross comes to know Jesus as the Son of God. My question for us is, if we will lead the chorus of creation this week and sing his praises. I have offered us a summary of Passion Week, and I pointed to the interconnectedness of these events. That all of these events, even the triumphal entry, lead to the cross and ultimately the grave. But allow me to challenge you to evaluate your heart. Are you among those who recognize and cry out praises to Christ? Or are you among those who, whose heart is dull and unwilling to praise your maker? Let me challenge you. No matter what is going on in your life these days, respond to what God in Christ has done for you. Respond to what God in Christ has done for you. Respond to that invitation 
to take your place in the chorus that sings his praises. The story of Palm Sunday is is connected with the, the story of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Don't for one minute think that you can only sing praises when life looks merry and cheerful. Don't don't grow silent and let your heart flee when, when trials of Good Friday come. The women that, that had followed Jesus remained faithful. They, they stood there at the cross and they were joined by a single apostle. Remain faithful. Remain faithful. Follow the example of those women and that single apostle. Remain true to Christ in these trying times. Jesus is not only the the king of Palm Sunday. He's also the, the suffering servant of Good Friday and the triumphant Lord of Easter. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your steadfast faithfulness to your Father's will. We we confess that we are weak and fickle. We easily turn aside and wander from your presence. We pray that you would stir our hearts to love you more than we might, that we might walk the road of suffering to your glory and with your praises on our lips. Amen.